Hi, I'm Karen Hurd. I'm here with our next edition of Asking for a Friend. And I am absolutely delighted today to have Jennifer Moss uh, joining me with uh, talking about her new book, The Burnout Epidemic. And I know this is so hot on everyone's hearts and minds right now, the rise of chronic stress and how we can fix it. So Jennifer, welcome to the show. I'm so thrilled to be here. It's going to be great, Karen. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's this is there's some irony in you being my guest today because I am trying to go on vacation next week, and <laughs> the list of things that I've had. You know, when you have take a week off, all of the things that you squeeze into the week before. So David is uh, my my husband and business partner is upstairs laughing like, oh, burnout, cute. That's cute. <laughs> that is really funny. It's actually funny because the ADP did this one survey. They found that it's about 17 hours of vacation debt on each side of taking a vacation. Yeah. So you're feeling what what really happens when people take time off. It's unfortunate. It's yeah. you need a vacation from your vacation is so apt. Yeah, yeah. So uh in a moment I'm gonna ask you what has been a, a moment of source of or sorts of strength or inspiration for you in this last couple of years. But first I wanna say, hey, Natalie, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you will have a question uh, for Jennifer today. So, um, you know, I always, I'm asking every one of my guests that, uh, Jennifer, just, you know, what has been something that's been really a source of inspiration or strength for you? You know, I believe in, and this is going to sound sort of like nerdy academia stuff, but I do believe in the dialectical theory of opposites. And um, there has been a lot of distraction and stress about working from home in the middle of the pandemic and having all the kids around and trying to do, you know, everything that you have to do to, to juggle that, especially as a mom and as a woman. But having that said, I have really found this strength in turning back the dial. We were just all over the place. Every kid was in every, you know, single sport and activity. And we were always on the go and we were dividing and conquering. And the slowing down piece has been very healthy for me. And uh, I think it's been a big part of why I didn't burn out actually through this um, cycle of writing a book on burnout in the middle of a global pandemic. Yeah, nice. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so we have Eileen McDar here. She has been a previous guest on Asking for a Friend, and she is a resiliency expert. So I'm sure she's going to have some interesting questions for you as well. Welcome, Eileen. So I want to talk uh, in our conversation about this at three levels, because in reading your book, you are so passionate about mm -hmm. we've got to fix this at a systemic level. And you know, David and I were, uh, again, 11 o'clock at night after we're on an airplane and I'm talking to him about preparing for this. And, you know, he's like, yes. And how do you fix the system? Because that is so true. So I know you're passionate about that. Mm -hmm. And then of course, I want to talk about what do you do at a team level if you are the supervisor mm -hmm. and then what do you, recommendations do you have at an individual level? Right. So let's start about thinking about the system or your overall organization. Yes. Yeah, so this is a big, important statement that I think has been buried for a long time. And we've tried to solve burnout with self-care alone. And I will be saying that modeling self-care and self-care is still very important. It's just if we're going to really think about preventing burnout in a, a, an authentic, reasonable and, uh, and uh, you know, authentic way, we need to make sure that we are going way further upstream and tackling it. And that piece of, um, you know, what the WHO did, the World Health Organization did in 2019, where they identified burnout as institutional stress left unmanaged occupational phenomena, and, and putting it, you know, burnout into their international classification of diseases. That was so so, so fundamental. It was a milestone for a lot of us in this space because it's saying, okay, we need to look at the root causes of burnout and make this a very serious issue or else it's not going to be solved. So you break it down and find out that those six root causes of burnout are actually all institutional. It's overwork. It's lack of fairness. It's lack of agency. It's, um, it's lack of community. It's 
you know, it's feeling othered and discriminated against. It's, you know, these now always on cultures. We're seeing that and feeling mismatched to our values because we're so overworked. We're disengaged from the purpose. You know, these are things that you cannot just download, you know, an app and listen to rain for 15 seconds and it's going to solve it. It can't be solved with subsidized gym memberships, more yoga, you know, all the things that are really good intentions, but they're far too downstream. So, you know, we're giving ice cream to people that need water and we need to change that mindset. So understanding it from an institutional level means attacking the problems way, way earlier on and dealing with the hygiene stuff, the table stakes stuff first, and then motivating after we've got that kind of leveled out. Do you have some examples of an organization that has done that well, that really looked at their systems to make things better? I'm, I'm starting to see a lot more now, for sure. People are responding. I mean, for example, you know, it's been a byproduct of the pandemic that more telehealth and teletherapy has been offered. So looking at it, for, you know, at these, again, access to more help, um, making it more anonymous. Um, you know, Hewlett Packard is a great example. I use them because they did, they fared pretty well during the pandemic, but a lot of what they were doing leading up to it was looking at societal issues that create these root causes, like lack of fairness, for example, and they have really strong paid leave policies that they had before, equitable maternity leaves, care leaves, grief policies, all of these things are so instrumental in making sure, you know, for example, the fact that we've lost millions of women from the workforce, because they are the only people that are responsible for primary caregiving, and that shouldn't be the case. But our policies manifest that. And so the companies that were already doing a lot of that in the crisis, they didn't see the same exodus, for example, of those, you know, vulnerable groups of their organization. Um, we're also seeing this more right now in just this ability to, um, to think about paid leave in general uh, across organizations and understanding that there was a lot of people that had to deal with loss, you know, and, and handle it in the moment. So these are, again, these are the upstream mindsets. This is giving people the opportunity to drop job craft, even flexibility. This is what I was writing before the pandemic was so critical. Now we swung the pendulum really far in one direction. And it's like, well, how do we now get back to the middle and still have friendships and relationships working remotely? So, you know, again, it's tackling these problems, being agile to them, and also working at them much further upstream. Yes, you mentioned grieving, and because that is one of the things from a systemic perspective that really stuck out at me. And I thought back uh, to my year, years ago, I was an HR director and at a Fortune uh, 10 company. And one of the things that we were dealing with was these policies about bereavement. And I remember feeling totally shackled by these policies. You know, okay, so it's, oh, well, it's just, just your uncle. Well, you have, and that is such a judgment yeah. about just your uncle, that may be the uncle that raised you. It may be, right? So how, what suggestions do you have with that? Well, one again, it's it's about making your grief policies inclusive. Um, one company right now, Media Monks, for example, has just changed all of their language um, to give anyone that wants it. Um, you know, it's not called maternity or uh, paternity leave. It's just parental leave, and it can be anyone. You know, it doesn't matter how you're represented, and so that language has to be inclusive. It also has to include those other people. Um, we can't just make it only for women we, with bereavement and grief, for example, we've seen changes in that. It's just called care leave or grief bereavement leave, where it isn't like you get extra time because of this um, particular circumstance. There's been much more um, awareness now in our grief policies that deal with um, a stillbirth, which is a big one. I know Google has made some huge strides right now in really expanding their, you know, their paid time off and giving protections for people. They have this ramp up time, even if you come back after being away that you can work part time at 100% of your pay. Uh, these are the things that we need to start thinking about too, that, you know, a Hewlett Packard has just come back with this. What is return to office look like first it's hybrid, which is really essential, I think to lots of organizations to think that way, but also they're doing things like instead of life on site, having chefs there till 
eight o'clock at night cooking for you. It's like here, I have chefs that are going to prepare food for you to go home and eat with your family. Um, understanding that our social contract with work has changed and that we want people to actually care about our well-being. We don't mind that they're part of that business now. And that is um, a definitely a fundamental change from the pandemic. Uh, thank you. I, you know, I was thinking about my my son and daughter-in-law are fostering two little babies mm -hmm. and the company, they said, you know, huh? They So they take, she's taken on a two-year-old and she's got this infant, right? And the company went, huh, we don't have a foster care policy. Yeah. And they said to her, what do you recommend we do? And she got to help design their first policy and it was radically generous. And she is so loyal to this company because they really met her where she was and said, I care about you. We want you here for the long run. And I, that's an example, I think, of the creativity and innovation that people need to be thinking about. They do. And, and, and I think it, it, you know, we can't just look to a declaration of what you know, what one behavior is going to look like. And that's sort of what we had before we had a, you know, wellness program, and it included a few things and some, you know, courses you could take, and your EAP was available to you, but most people didn't even know what was in it. You know, now it's like, here is exactly where you can get access to these things. And here's what we're offering. Um, it's much more personalized. I think the future of work when it comes to human centered leadership, you know, something that I totally agree with you on is going to be critical is empathy. You know, empathetic leadership will be so critical and active listening and much more direct manager um, a kind of ability to, to actively listen, make change, be more agile, be more nuanced in the way that we're supporting people and understanding that we're all coming at this from different perspectives, just different bias and history and privilege. And, and, and so we need to be able to get people where, like you said, meet them where they're at, or else we're going to see people resign at the same levels that they have been over the last year. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is a perfect segue because we have some questions coming in. So uh, let's talk about Natalie's question. She says uh, for 2020. Uh, so she says, I'm interested in the overwork uh, can you pop that one up, Jared? I'm having trouble seeing it. Uh, Natalie's question. Yes. Uh, four words, the war for talent, trying to encourage time off and balancing that with many open positions and understaffed teams is a message that feels tone deaf to employees at times. Any suggestions? Yeah, it is really difficult right now with the vacuum of um, from the attrition that we've seen. And there's a lot of people that we've lost. You lose a, a high performer within a team and then you're just all trying to scramble. And a lot of leaders are taking on the bulk of it. So it is very challenging to, um, <laughs> you know, to encourage people to take breaks and take time away. Um, when you just have just so much more work. And this is where the institutional piece really plays a role because organizations can't be looking at this time frame as business as usual or having stretch goals. I mean, maybe not is not the time to have this rapid growth acceleration. Even though we want to meet market demand, there's a way for us to have sustainable ways of you know planning out how we're going to get there. And if we don't do it sustainably, we're seeing you know 40 to 45 percent of workforce is turning over, which is really difficult to work under those conditions for any period of time, never mind in the long term. So I think what we need to understand is that it might be just about trying to reduce workload by increments. And I have this, you know, intervention that I suggest within organizations and within teams and managers is really try to narrow down the inefficiencies. Looking at the four day work week, I mean, it sounds like it's impossible. But when you actually look at the data, people are more productive, more engaged when they reduce inefficiencies. That's meeting guidelines. That's uh, analyzing how often you're checking in, how often you work on urgent needs versus priority needs. Are you under trained in certain areas? Can you just get more technical training to make you faster, more efficient? These are the ways that we reduce the inefficiencies. And we found this intervention, you know, after about six months reduces workload by about 22%. Mm -hmm. And then you can have a little bit more time to take those breaks. And, and you can only do that through lots and lots of communication amongst coworkers and their bosses. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I really agree with you. So Ryan has a good question too. Uh, so he is, um, I, I'm interested in the overworked burnout. What are tips frontline leaders? That's where we're headed next anyway. So that's perfect. Can use with their team when working through these realities of today's jobs. You know, I, I'm telling you, it is unbelievable how much more we're working. And, you know, and I talk about the inefficiencies, but it's also the over collaboration. I mean, when you're when you're actually looking at how much meetings have increased, just Microsoft data alone is saying so imagine you can extrapolate this across Google and Zoom and all these others. Mm -hmm. But we're meeting 228% more year over year, we're sending out 40.6 billion more emails, we're on chat 60% more, we're sharing more uh, docs than we ever have before. And so what's happened is we've taken the way that we behaved in March 2020, because that's what we had to do. It was an emergency. But by definition, emergencies are unexpected. And we're still acting like this is unexpected. And we're not taking a moment to see, you know, how do I create a right to disconnect guidelines within my teams? How do I make sure that I'm modeling the behavior of self-care, which means like getting that space, making sure that I'm not... Um, you know, like the inefficiencies piece, but also making sure that I'm not over meeting, making sure that only the people that need to be in that meeting are there. And you asking um, more openly, if you have the ability to do this by saying, is it necessary for me to be in this meeting? You know, what am I providing? I have a, like lots of on the go projects. I just want to make sure that if I'm there, then I'm really contributing because we over loop because we don't want to put people off or think that they're not valuable. Mm -hmm. Instead, it, you know, instead, when someone doesn't invite you to a meeting, say, thank you. I love you for giving me my time back. Mm -hmm. Start creating that permission to be able to take that space and move away from those inefficiencies. The more that we pull back on those types of small, tangible, tactical, you know, actions, the more we'll see our time coming back to us. Oh, yes. It's interesting. We were doing a leadership development program and what we were talking about meetings. And one of the guys said, hey, can I just say something to his peers? His peers are all in this training. Yeah. I am no longer going to attend a meeting unless there you send me an agenda and an invite list. Yeah. And everybody went, what? And he's yes. like, no, seriously, because I, I am tired of going to meetings that I could have set somebody on my team uh, or, you know, it's really not the best use of my time. So I'm happy to come. Just make sure I know what's going on. Absolutely. And having, I love this because, you know, why can't we have more asynchronous meetings? They're all being recorded, you know, watch it when you can flip through the things that you don't, you know, that don't aren't relevant to you. And then we need to be more actionable. Like there's so many meetings that don't result in any sort of actions, making sure that that meeting wasn't just to you know, talk about an idea. And then the next time we talk about the idea some more, there needs to be much more tangible outcomes. And so if you're the one leading the meeting, set the tone by doing that. And maybe if at first you're saying, hey, I, I was going to invite you to this meeting, but I know you've got a lot going on and you're not going to necessarily, you know, feel like it's valuable for your time. So I'm going to give you that time back, you know, micromanage it a bit by not in the bad way of micromanaging right, right. it, but micromanage it and just over communicating that this isn't a slight, this is a gift. Yes. And the more that we do that and just get more, you know, create that permission amongst our teams, I think that is just a huge area where we can gain time back in our day. Yeah. Oh, we're big believers in meetings that go like this. So yeah. invite every, all these are the topic that everyone wants to hear and then let people go so that everybody doesn't sit there through the whole meeting. I, I love that. That's that's a great uh, strategy too. You know, great tactic. Just let people go. If you don't need to be here, goodbye. <laughs> okay. One of the things that was really heart wrenching, and I, I as I kept reading, I kept thumbing, putting down, you know, taking notes and turning over pages, was all the good intentions that people, you know really human centered leaders really caring deeply about their team, trying mm -hmm. to do things to help with the mental health, to help prevent the burnout. And your research says some of that is backfiring. Mm -hmm. uh, things like, uh, you know, virtual yoga or the Fitbit challenges, um, all good things on the surface. Can you talk about some of the challenges and what someone should do before implementing something like that? 
Absolutely. So I'm a big fan of asking first. I mean, because a lot of people could be in agreement, you know, there could be 90% of your staff that want to go back to work, for example, but you've just decided that everyone wants to be remote because you haven't asked because that's just the trend. You know, we need to know how much and, and lots of really strong organizations, again, just ask, they ask, how much do you want to be in the office? Um, and that's a, another big sort of, um, you know, issue that we're talking about right now that return to office and what people want and what people don't want. Ask the office party. I talk about that, you know, ask if people actually love the Christmas party or the holiday party or, or do they feel excluded because it's a holiday they don't celebrate, you know, find out how people feel about it. And if the majority of people do then create a space where everyone can be included, but still host it, you know, if that's what people want, but if people would rather you spend your, you know, our budget, the, the capacity, you know, to spend money in some other way, then do that instead. A lot of it is asking again, the good intentions, the life on site piece where, you know, you're getting your dry cleaning done and you have all these things that are available to you on campus that just sets an invisible pressure that being seen as being, you know, better at your job than someone else, which creates a lot of inequity. And then a lot of what we saw in the pandemic was well-being as workload. You know, let's have a happy hour as we talked about, or, you know, let's, um, you know, let's have a pet parade on Fridays at the end of the week with our families. It was like, I'm so burned out. I am so exhausted. The last thing I want to do is wrangle my golden retriever to have her, you know, parade across, you know, the my screen. It's just these things really end up being tone deaf. One of the people that I interviewed too had mobility issues. And so then they're now feeling like um, that they're really uncomfortable about not being able to participate in the Fitbit challenge. It was very exclusive. Those that are dealing again, mobility issues or, or, um, you know, weight issues. Those are the kind of things that I kept hearing was, wow, it actually made me feel worse. And then when we also had the yoga with our boss, this one woman told me that sweating and bending over and, you know, grunting in front of my boss together with my team was really awful. She, she hated it. So again, it's understanding that these are all good intentions. If everyone wants to really participate, and if you're just trying to, you know, throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks and, mm -hmm. you know, that's good. We're trying and, and airing and then reiterating and, and fixing it, but don't think that this is how it has to be because it's your idea and you're so married to it that you can't let it go. Um, and we see that in this whole, you know, company saying, come back to work five days a week, want you to bat be moving back to Manhattan or San Francisco. Companies are realizing that they're losing people because of that. So let's ask and then respond, you know, through empathy. Yeah. And you don't have to figure it out yourself. Uh, that's, you know, some of our clients we're seeing are doing a really good job of bringing together committees and the committee, it's not just the committee's idea to just decide, the committee's idea to ask and invite and then bring those in and offer offerings. And I'm seeing yeah. higher quality ideas from those that are involving more people. Yeah, you really, you really um, get to meet, again, like you said, meet people where they're at when you just ask what they want and, and be really open about the fact that, you know, this is what our budget is, or, you know, maybe I can't, because you're going to have people say, I need more resources, whatever, you know, this thing is that maybe you can't do right away. But let's create an advocacy that plan then for someone who might need a resource or let's, you know, work through solutions together as a team to figure out, you know, how we can actually get to that goal that everyone wants. I mean, so much of it is is really frequent and consistent active listening, just asking and actioning and being honest about what you can do and what you can't do. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Uh, Jerry, if you could pop up, Eileen has some good ideas on meetings. So I just want to acknowledge those. Those are those are great, Eileen. So as we talk, uh, Jennifer, uh, so I am positive we have people listening and saying, okay, yeah, I get it for my team. But what about me? I am burned out. And one of the things that is very, you, you talk about this very much, especially in healthcare workers, and we see this we see this with our healthcare clients. We see this with our nonprofit clients. The most the people that are most mission driven are the ones almost at most risk because they care so much. And what, what advice do you have someone who's sitting with that on their heart and mind right now? 
You know, uh, there's a reason why burnout was first defined as caregiver syndrome in the healthcare, you know, industry. And it is because there's this passion piece to it that can work in a, in a harmonious way if we're balanced, but it can become obsessive and it can become dangerous when you actually look at highly engaged, you know, workers, teachers are another example of this, nurses, uh, physicians, use and those working in nonprofit too. So they can be highly, highly engaged. And we often measure, you know, like um, wellness by engagement. And it's actually not necessarily accurate because they can be highly engaged, but can be very unwell, be extremely mm -hmm. stressed because they care so much about the stakeholder. And so we've seen this real you know, disconnect. And when that disconnect happens, that cynicism, because, you know, burnout shows up in high levels of exhaustion and depletion. It shows up in sort of that lack of emotional connection to our work or, or efficacy in our jobs. But then when it hits cynicism, the, those are the three big signs. When it becomes cynical, you start to use really fixed mindset words like um, always and never, like this is always going to be like this. It's never going to change. I can't do anything about it using, you know, very individual language. All of this is sort of saying like, I have moved away from what matters to me about the job. Mm -hmm. And now it's just the work and the work load is 70, 80 hours a week or longer. It's overwhelming. And so I'm just doing the work and it's not giving me the joy and the passion is what I wanted to do this job in the first place. So it, that is where overwork and, and burnout really play a role in roles that are so critical to our community. I mean, we can't lose this many nurses. Um, we have hospitals shutting down because there's not enough care. I mean, the macroeconomic effect of losing teachers in this mass teacher shortage we're in, we're not really thinking downstream about the fact that burnout has these major impacts on our economy and, and on lives first, but, uh, but bigger, you know, uh, in the fact that we won't be able to give care to other people that need it. So, you know, I, I've been really pushing to make sure that we don't devalue that passion by overworking people because that's a necessary component to someone being able to you know be resilient through especially through a crisis but mm -hmm. beyond that yeah how do you recommend someone who is feeling that way to talk to their manager about it well you know it, it i you know, did the, we did some research inside the pandemic and what we found uh, was this data point, which I thought was really interesting is 67% of people, and we looked at 46 different countries, it was a global survey, 67% of people didn't feel like they could talk about mental health at work. And of that 67%, they were always or often burned out. So it's a major impact if you can talk about mental health at work. So, you know, I can't say, you know, and hear and be tone deaf and recognize that there are still not a lot of stigma around that. Yeah. Um, and so just talking to your boss can be very difficult uh, if you're feeling burned out because for a long time, because there wasn't a definition around burnout, it was sort of nebulous. It wasn't taken seriously. You know, one, I think Jill LaCour in the New York Times talked about it as a whiny millennial problem. You know, um, we just need re more religion in our lives. <laughs> and it was like, you know, we really downgraded the kind of catastrophic impacts of it. And so now people don't feel like they can talk about burnout. That's changing, I think, because mm -hmm. we just see mm -hmm. such mass burnout and right. now people are talking about it and there's prevention strategies. But we do need to sometimes, you know, be be forthcoming if we can. But if we don't feel safe in that, we need to look to those anonymous um, options like our EAPs, like our individual supports, like the teletherapy, see what's available to us. Not everyone has the privilege of accessing that either. So what is available in our community that we can get support with? And then if it is a last straw, you know, having that conversation with your boss, if you feel like you can to get supports is crucial or it's leaving the company if it's that toxic. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. All right, we have one final question and then we're going to close. So I wanna bring up Katie's question here. Uh, what are effective ways to meet people where they are returning, for example, for returning to work while also meeting company policies? Thanks, Katie. Yeah, it's important because, you know, the social contract has changed, but there's still a transactional relationship between employees and employers. And so, you know, it can't be that there's a full pendulum, you know, swing and 
employers don't have any rights to ask for certain, you know, needs or, um, or behaviors from their employees, it has to be a mutually beneficial relationship. But it is about, you know, um, I, like I said, like asking what people need and being able to be the driver to that information and, and, and managers are really, you know, and I think they're playing a bigger role than ever. Um, and they have to be more of, you know, higher in emotional intelligence, psychological fitness. So there's more demands being placed on leaders to play these roles. But I say, you know, talk to your employees about your own role, that you're not a, a mental health professional, but you're a mental health conduit and that you mm -hmm. are going to get, you know, really well versed. And you, you do this before having these conversations with your teams, but get really well versed in what is available to those people on your team, whether it's locally, whether it's within the organization, which is whether it's within programming, books, you know, that can support people and just making sure that you're kind of over communicating about all the tools and options that people have. So then they feel more comfortable having those conversations with you. And sometimes, you know, when we don't think we have those options, when we start to research what is available, there's a lot of things that we can do that are baked already baked into our policies. You know, if we want to be leaders and advocates, spend some time with the HR team. It seems like the HR team is always so separate from leadership. Let's go as a manager and talk to the HR team and say, hey, I really want to help prevent burnout in my team. What can I do? I mean, they would love to hear from leaders asking them that question. They feel so siloed. So let's do more collaboration with the HR team and the wellness team inside of our organization and figure out how you can be more of an advocate for your team by giving them the data that they need to, to make those really important decisions about wellness inside of our organizations. Oh, I can hear the echoes of every single HR person I've ever met going, amen, amen. <laughs> Listen to Jennifer. All right. Uh, I'll give you an opportunity to give us one last piece of advice if you have it, and then tell us where people can learn more about you and your really good book. I think the the whole, you know, thing that I've been saying right now is, um, you know, there's no right way to feel right now. And I think, we're going to have really great days. We're in a healing phase a bit, but there's still a lot of uncertainty and we're tired. We're really tired. We haven't given ourselves enough compassion and grace, and we need to do more of that. I think of myself and I had this relationship with the dishwasher that was really dysfunctional. It felt like it was gremlins just growing dishes. I couldn't unload and load the dishwasher enough times in the day. There was a lot of productivity shaming and self-shaming when you're a high-performing person, you want to do it all. I don't think we can actually do it all ever, but inside the pandemic, we should be saying, patting ourselves on the back every single day and saying, good job for making it through another day in a major catastrophic event, a macro stress, you did it again. And leave some of that guilt behind. If any time, you know, if not now, when? It's now for us to create a little bit more self-compassion and, and grace for others who are in the same boat. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, David is saying, my husband, he's saying that our dishwasher has that same gremlin. <laughs> so annoying. Um, all right. Well, thank you so very much, Jennifer. It's been an absolute joy to have you on the show today. Thank you so much, Karen. It was so, so delightful. Thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, next time we're going to have uh, Beverly Kay and she is very, very well known uh, retention expert, a career development. And I have interviewed her in person recorded. So it's a dynamic uh, conversation that we'll have next Friday on Asking for a Friend.